Well, that was George Osborne's last budget of this government. Here it is, the budget 2015. And it may well be the last budget of his career as Chancellor. We don't know what's going to happen after May the 7th. But what we do know is that the IOD policy experts will still be here. That's Stephen Herring, Head of Taxation, and Dan Lewis, who's Senior Infrastructure Policy Advisor. And the two of them join me now for a quick debrief and chat over the contents of that budget. Stephen, you're Head of Taxation here at the Institute of Directors. Our members will know you well by now, of course. Um, let's surprise them and start on an optimistic note. Tell us something that we liked in this budget. Tell us something that British business is going to like in this budget. Well, I think the first message is that uh, it's a year, another year, where the, the doom mongers have been proven wrong, that the fiscal position is secure enough that we don't need to be looking for additional sources of, of tax. The budget's a, a broadly balanced budget, and there's a little bit of room in there for tax cuts both now and post the general election. So we'll certainly be campaigning for those that will help business growth and employment and the UK economy generally. And Dan, just uh, let's turn to your brief for a moment here. Energy, infrastructure, not unrelated to what Stephen was saying about tax reform and tax cuts, there's been some good news for the oil and gas industry. Absolutely, and boy do they need it, because we have 400,000 jobs tied up in North Sea oil and gas, and uh, they're currently struggling because we've seen oil prices drop by half over the last few months. So what this means is that the massive amount of investment that's been cut, and the government's losing taxes. So what they're really doing here, they're trying to cut tax to actually get more tax back. And let me pick up on the energy point. Was there anything in this budget to further incentivise the shale industry onshore in the UK? And if not, should there have been? Well, no, there was nothing specific for the shale at uh, this time. I think what we're really waiting for is, some, is really for the next government, uh, for the 14th onshore licensing round to conclude. Uh, and to see maybe 200 exploration wells so we actually get a proper idea of uh, what's there and how, uh, what price we can get it out at. Stephen, a lot of people were talking about the Chancellor putting a rabbit out of his hat today and I suppose in a way he did, so they're just not perhaps in the way people would expect because instead of funding some pre-election giveaways, he actually announced, I think it was a £22 billion the uh, government have gained from the sale of our stake in the banks to pay down our debts. Now we welcome that. Exactly, because if the amount of aggregate debt's going down, that creates more room in the future for uh, further cuts to taxation to incentivise businesses and individuals, also for key infrastructure projects like the Chancellor talked today about um, improving the digitalisation of the economy. So I think that's going to be, that's very important that we have room for those. On the tax, the broadest tax position, he also reiterated the reduction of the 21% rate of tax to 20%, which is, has become politically controversial, um, perhaps sadly so, because I, certainly I think it's very important that the UK is seen to be alongside those key OECD competitors that we have amongst the major economies with the lowest rate, and that 20% will, will put us at that point. We don't really want to have other countries that beat us in the race for global foreign direct investment on this criteria. And there was some chatter before the budget that there'd be an announcement on inheritance tax. Is that something that we're more likely to see now in perhaps the Conservatives' election manifesto? I think it is, because it's a disagreement within the coalition where you balance taxation of income versus taxation of wealth. Now, what we've called for is a much more fundamental examination of the taxation of capital. So we don't double up with capital gains tax and inheritance tax. We only really need one capital tax. So at the moment you can pay capital gains tax on selling an asset and then if you're unfortunate enough to, to die soon after you pay a further whack of inheritance tax on the already taxed gain. And that particular policy of merging those two taxes on capital forms sort of backbone of your call for a tax revolution, which of course features in your Priorities for Tax Reforms paper and that accompanying video, which you can find on the IOD website. Indeed, and we won't be giving up that campaign until, um, until we succeed in securing a simplify simplification of capital taxation. Remember that these two taxes, CGT and IHT, only collect about eight billion in total. It's a fairly small amount compared to the 165 billion 
that income tax collects and the 100, million, 100 billion that both VAT and national insurance collect. It's yeah. an, it, the reform's doable. And given that the Chancellor has announced the use of £22 billion pounds from the sale of our stakes in the banks to pay down the debt, which is a very sensible position, of course, it does put into perspective just quite how relatively small amounts are, are collected by these capital taxes. Absolutely. To the economy and the fiscal, the exchequer, they're small amounts. But to those business owners mm. that have to face both of those taxes, they're not small and they can put a, a burden on the, the next generation that wants to build the business business further. But Dan, there was a lot of talk in the budget and around the budget on what the Chancellor has been doing for infrastructure in the north of England, but it wasn't entirely confined to that part of the country, was it? There was quite a lot of encouraging movement in the southwest. Yes, absolutely. I mean, after all, you might say the southwest has been a long neglected area. Perhaps it's never been that well connected politically. So I think it's a good thing that we're talking about uh, big infrastructure investments in the southwest because Transport ultimately is a frictional cost of doing business. So if you can reduce those journey times, you can increase the potential for doing business. I think what really caught my eye was uh, they talked about intercity trains, fast ones, and they want to invest uh, three billion pounds in that. Um, so I think that would be a very good candidate for uh, the infrastructure best value index, which I proposed in the IOD uh, manifesto. So basically, we need to sort of rank the different infrastructure projects one against another uh, to decide whether it's worth doing, because this is, after all, the big problem facing the country. There's not enough money. So we've got to make some tough choices. And as far as the Tories and the Lib Dems are concerned, they're fighting over the South West, Cornwall in particular, like rats in a sack. So it's a bit of a shame, isn't it, that, that only, uh, only the tightening of that electoral battle brings to the fore the necessity to really invest in the infrastructure of that region. Yes, and you might also say it's a bit tied up with Scotland too. I think since the Scottish referendum, there's been a lot of interest in these other regions uh, that are ex-Scotland, uh, and they feel they've lost out over time. So I think there's a lot more political imperative behind that. And you mentioned Scotland. Let's just drill down a little bit more on some of the announcements around oil and gas industry in the region. Now, talk us through a little bit about precisely what that's going to look like and the impact it will have, not just on the sector, but possibly on the wider businesses of the region. Well, the starting point is the impact right now with oil prices having fallen 50% uh, is that effectively the North Sea oil and gas industry has gone into quite a big recession. Why does that matter? That matters because the government's losing taxes. It matters because jobs have been lost, wages have been cut. And so the only way they think that they can save this is with a pretty dramatic cut in taxation on the North Sea oil and gas industry. So what does that look like? Uh, they're reducing the supplementary charge from 30% uh, to 20%. And the second stage is to reduce the petroleum revenue tax uh, from 50 to 35%. That's quite significant. It is significant, but I would be cautious. I would be cautious because it's quite possible we may see further oil price falls and they will be driven by the uh, record amount of uh, crude oil stocks now in the United States, and also the possibility that Iran is going to bring 800,000 to a million additional barrels of oil to the oil market uh, if they reach a deal on the nuclear issue. All right, something to keep an eye on there. Stephen, let's spend a minute looking at some of the things mm -hmm. we're disappointed with. There were areas that we'd long campaigned on that the Chancellor didn't pick up on in this budget, um, and there were some things that we think he should have done that he chose not to. Yes, well, I'm going to mention two, two points that affect business and one that affects individuals. The, the first business point is that we have this totally new tax on business, the diverted profits tax, mm. which is... It's what they is, call the Google tax. What they call the Google's tax. I couldn't possibly comment about whether it would affect Google or not. <laughs> but the, um, uh, the whole purpose of when the coalition government came into office was to provide a predictable tax backdrop. And they introduced very sensibly a corporate tax roadmap, which basically says from... Um, gestation to birth, there's going to be a 15-month period. Now, the diverted profits tax has been accelerated and would be implemented six months after the first announcement. As opposed to the 15 months. As, absolutely. This is a political reason, isn't it? It's a political reason because politicians like to be say we're being hard on multinationals, avoiding tax. But as with all tax measures, that the innocent often get... Um, affected by the measures as well and um, 
another six months of consultation would have been the sensible thing to do so, and indeed yeah. consistent with the coalition government's own corporate tax roadmap. So there is still a scintilla of hope, but mm -hmm. no more than that, that between now and the parliament being dissolved, the politicians, both the opposition and the government might have have second thoughts about it, but obviously it's getting to be less and less likely as each day goes by. And we know from a survey of ID members that national insurance contributions, particularly employers' national insurance contributions, continue to be a drag on their ability to, to grow their business, and we, we didn't see much movement on that. We didn't. There was, there was almost nothing, really. A lot of the measures are very focused on the micro-businesses, but are not, of, apart from the broad-based approach to, to apprentices, mm. that haven't really affected uh, the cost for medium-sized businesses and larger businesses. And, you know, the employer's national insurance surcharge is a payroll tax, and uh, by definition it must uh, reduce the uh, job growth compared to it being lowered or, or, or restructured. So we'll continue to push for reform in that area. Anything else? For broad-based reforms in that area, I think, yes. Oh, the broadest of bases. Yes, yes. Anything else in particular that you were disappointed wasn't, wasn't to be included? Well, the Chancellor talked about the annual investment allowance, which bounced around during the coalition government and the previous Labour government from between £25,000 and £500,000. It's currently at £500,000. Now, this is... This relief is particularly focused on those medium-sized businesses because, frankly, it's immaterial to the largest businesses and it's above what the investment decisions that the micro-businesses are going to, going to make. So it's really an important relief for mid-sized businesses. Now, I think the Chancellor should have said that it was he intended for the relief to be no lower than the current £500,000. He said he will return to it in uh, the autumn statement, which the, the government considers autumn, of course, to be December. So he'll return to it in the autumn statement, or, or his successor. If he finds himself in or office. Or his successor. Uh, and, um, but I think that businesses generally welcome a predictable environment. Mm. A lot of business decisions aren't about a single year, but you're looking at a project where there might be three, four years of capital expenditure till it's, till it's met. And it would be very useful for business to have been given some assurances, as much as the politician can ever give, that the level of the annual investment allowance would remain at the existing level. OK, so we'll keep his toes to the fire on that point. Dan, final thought from you. I know there was something of interest on broadband in this, uh, in this budget. Yes, well, pretty exciting. I um, mean, for years we've heard about the death of distance, and I think this might be the beginning of the end of death of dis distance because what they're talking about is raising the universal service obligation from dial up speed, which means you can do basically nothing, uh, to five megabytes. And then, uh, much more exciting, they're talking about a hundred megabyte speed rolling out to almost all the country. So, not every look and, look and cranny, but a very large chunk of it. And what that means is you have a real chance of creating uh, a much more dynamic rural economy. So it doesn't all have to be in the cities. Uh, and, uh, and why not? Because after all, land is a very uh, big input in terms of price to any business. So if you can exploit some of those much lower rents in the rural areas, you could actually see some kind of rural digital dynamic coming, in, coming through. Stephen, we've looked a little bit at the taxation of businesses. What about the taxation of individuals? Yes, well, there was a, a very interesting point made by the Chancellor there, who seemed to have taken note that it's not right to meet the cost of raising the personal allowance by cutting down the higher rate tax threshold, which drags more and more people mm. into the 40 pence rate of tax, fiscal drag, as, as we refer to it. And he has said that for the tax year after next, in fact, that the... Uh, threshold will be increased and for the first time for, for many years. Now that's good news. Now what we would like to see is that that became a commitment to triple lock the higher rate tax threshold so it rises by the highest of consumer prices, earnings growth or say a fixed two and a half percent rather like the, the state pension 
is going to be triple locked to those those criteria and that would be a long-term solution but it is good news that the Chancellor's taken note that he can't keep doing that and drag millions of more people into the high rate tax so but we'd now like to see one year become a more permanent commitment. Dan Stephen, thank you both very much. And of course, you can find the full response to the Budget 2015 at iod.com. Just find the policy unit. And indeed, you'll also find full policies from the rest of our team of experts there, including Stephen Herring's tax revolution video.